Uh, so welcome back to the poster session and I hope you guys have some coffee. Uh, our next speaker now is Matt Hoffman and he's doing his postdoc. Come on, we are with Andrew Kelvin. Yes. Alright, uh, so thanks a lot for the introduction for the, uh, for the invitation. It's very exciting. Uh, um, so I'm going to talk to you about the no U-turn sampler, uh, or NUTS, N-U-T-S. Um, <coughs> so at a very high level, what, uh, what we're, the problem we're trying to address is this problem of sampling from unnormalized distributions, where this comes up that we care, it comes up in a few places, but the place that we care about is the situation where we want to do Bayesian inference. So we've got uh, a Bayesian posterior that's proportional to the probability of our, light, uh, of our data given some parameters times the prior probability of our parameters. Uh, but we don't know how to normalize that, so we have to use Markov chain Monte Carlo if we want to sample from that uh, posterior distribution. So what, uh, what NUTS is, is an extension of this Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, or HMC algorithm, also known as hybrid Monte Carlo, um, which is an efficient MCMC algorithm that gets a lot less efficient if you get your problem-specific hand-tuning wrong. Uh, so the point of NUTS, is, the primary point of NUTS is to be an adaptive extension of HMC that uh, retains and in some cases actually improves on HMC's efficiency while getting rid of this uh, need to hand-tune your problem-specific parameters, which is both annoying and actually expensive. Um, so uh, just a very quick review of HMC. Uh, so the basic idea is that we can actually sample from these distributions by setting up an appropriate uh, fictitious physical system and simulating the dynamics of that physical system. So if we uh, gener so we're going to construct a Hamiltonian, which is a potential energy function and a kinetic energy function. Um, the potential energy function is going to be our minus log our negative log posterior. Um, and we'll introduce a momentum vector R uh, that is uh, endowed with a Gaussian <coughs> distribution, which corresponds to a quadratic kinetic energy function. Um, and, uh, and the way that HMC works is we begin by resampling R from its distribution, which is just a multivariate normal. Um, so that basically is just a Gibbs sampling step. Um, then we evolve the state uh, theta and R by simulating some number L of, uh, of, a discretized, of discretized steps that approximate the continuous dynamics of this physical system that we've set up. Um, and, uh, and then we accept or reject the uh, evolved versions of our state theta r based on the accuracy of the simulation. So if you want to think about this as a metropolis algorithm, which is the right way to think about it, um, basically what we're doing is generating a metropolis proposal by simulating these Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, and the trick is that we're able to actually move quite far from where we started uh, while retaining a high acceptance probability because um, negative log prob the negative log joint probability in this model is uh, equivalent to the energy of the system. Energy is conserved in physical systems, so the uh, log probability of the proposal is going to be close to the log pr probability that we started with, which means a metropolis acceptance probability close to one. Um, so here's an example taken of uh, an HMC iteration taken from Radford Neal's excellent uh, tutorial on the subject, which I recommend to anybody who's interested in this. Um, so we start with the position that's here, uh, minus one and a half, minus one and a half, I think. Um, and the iteration begins by randomly, basically you can imagine, uh, right, so we're trying to sample from a, a two-dimensional multivariate normal with reasonably strong correlations. Uh, you can imagine a physical system that's like uh, this sort of quadratic shaped basin um, that's sort of long and skinny. Um, and if we have a ball that's just kind of standing, sitting here to begin with, we flick it in a random direction, um, which in this case is like minus one, one, um, and then evolve the dynamics over time. What, you, what happens is you sort of trace out this oscillating path. Eventually it turns around and comes back towards where it started. We run it, so we, in this example, we're running for 25 steps, um, and we get here, ultimately, um, and uh, so that's a, a reasonable distance from where we started, which is a good thing. Um, and uh, here, it's, this is the Hamiltonian, which is the energy of the system, which is the negative log joint probability of the position and momentum, um, right? So basically, this minus this exponentiated is going to be our acceptance probability. So that's e to the minus 0.4, which is, uh, which is not astronomically small. Um, so there's a very good chance we'll accept this proposal. Um, 
So that's, uh, that's HMC in a nutshell. Um, just to sort of further motivate uh, HMC and you know, try and anecdotally convince you that this is actually much more efficient, a much more efficient way to sample often than uh, more popular methods such as Random Walk Metropolis, um, uh, RWM, uh, or Gibbs sampling. Um, here uh, we're trying to sample from a 250 dimensional normal, which you know, if, you're, um, if you had a 250 dimensional posterior with strong correlations, maybe it might look something like this. Um, uh, so there are very strong correlations between every variable. Um, and uh, so the, here on the right are some independent samples drawn from that distribution. Uh, here are some samples drawn, uh, generated by NUTS, which is, um, uh, uh, like I said, an, uh, an extension of this Hamiltonian sampling idea. Um, and it's, you know, you can see it's done a reasonable job of sampling from the target distribution. Uh, here are some samples drawn using Gibbs sampling, uh, run for about the same length of time, a little longer, actually, as NUTS. Um, and you can see that it hasn't really done a great job of exploring the distribution. It, I wouldn't say that uh, with confidence there's even one effectively independent sample in there. Uh, and Metropolis is just kind of hopeless uh, for this high dimensional distribution, not even that high dimensional distribution with strong correlations. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of the motivations. We want to be able to get we, this kind of sampling efficiency um, that we get with HMC. Uh, so. Um, just to summarize sort of pros and cons of HMC, it's able to suppress this random walk behavior that you see with random walk metropolis and Gibbs sampling, which um, basically are able to take only small steps at a time. They're only able to generate small proposals that will be accepted with high probability, um, which means that they explore this space via a random walk, which means that they require order D squared steps if they want to get a distance D from where they started, which is really bad. Um, Right, like that kind of scaling is just not very um, acceptable. Uh, and uh, also HMC has nice, uh, much nicer theoretical scaling with dimensionality than Metropolis does or Gibbs. You know, Gibbs is a little harder to analyze because there are some pathological cases where it's perfect. But, um, but in the usual case, it's, uh, it's far from perfect. Um, downsides to HMC, uh, it requires gradients, which means that it's not really something you can use on discrete variables. You can use it. Um, in conjunction with Gibbs sampling for your discrete variables, but it doesn't solve that problem. Um, and the thing that we're going to be addressing is this issue uh, that it has these parameters associated with the simulation. So there's a step size epsilon. You want that to be small so that you get high acceptance probabilities in a reasonably accurate simulation, but you also want it to be large so that you don't have to take a million steps to travel a small distance. Um, so you have to get that right. Um, and, uh, and then there's the simulation length L, which again, you want to be, you don't want to be too small because if it's too small, then you're only going to move a small distance each iteration and, uh, and you'll revert to random walk behavior, which as we discussed is bad. Um, but if it's too long, you actually get another really bad thing happening. Um, so there's the obvious bad thing, which is that, uh, so each one of these simulation steps requires that you compute a gradient, which is, you know, not cheap. Um, uh, and so you don't want to do more of them than you need to. But in fact, it's even worse than that, right? So in this example, I would argue that actually we're taking too many steps, right? So we move, move, move. So the point of HMC is that we're able to travel a far distance from where we started and, you know, accept with high probability. Uh, so here we're moving, 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 making progress, making progress, making progress until we get to this area that's circled in red. Um, and then we start to turn around and move back towards where we started. And so at that point, what we're doing is we are paying a computational price to make negative progress, right? So that's not good. Uh, so the core idea behind NUTS is we want to be able to choose the simulation length automatically, uh, right? Because it's a pain to run a bunch of preliminary runs to figure out what it should be um, and that sort of thing. Uh, and so what we'd like to do, our sort of guiding principle is that uh, once we start to make a U-turn, right? Once we turn around and start moving backwards, uh, it's time to stop the simulation. Putting that a little bit more formally, um, we want to stop the Hamiltonian simulation when running it for an infinitesimal <coughs> length of fictitious time uh, would actually decrease the distance to where we started, right? And if you do some very simple calculus, uh, that basically winds up being equivalent to this condition here, that uh, when the dot product between the momentum variable and the vector from where we started to where we are goes negative, then it's time to stop the simulation. Um, 
uh, that corresponds to basically the vector from where we started to where we are and the momentum vector, right, if it's more than 90 degrees, keep going. If it's even a little bit less than 90 degrees, it's time to stop. Um, so at a high level, uh, each iteration of knots proceeds by, as an HMC, we begin by resampling this momentum vector. Um, then we sample a slice variable. Uh, if you're familiar with slice sampling, great. If you're not, um, don't worry too much about this. It's, uh, it's not critical. We could do knots without this. It just makes the algorithm a little bit simpler. Um, and that's pretty much all I'm going to say about it. Um, uh, so then we get to the meat of the algorithm where we trace out the Hamiltonian dynamics of theta and R, both forwards and backwards in time, uh, by a series of doublings. Um, so basically we take one step and then two steps and then four steps and we have to do either, we have to choose to go forwards and backwards randomly to um, satisfy a detailed balance which is necessary to ensure that we're actually sampling from the right thing. Um, and then, uh, and then we stop doubling when a particular kind of subtrajectory makes a U-turn, and at that point we sample carefully from among the points that, uh, that we visited so far. Um, so I'm going to go through an example run uh, iteration of nuts in uh, two slides, but first I want to build up this idea of the correspondence between this doubling procedure and, uh, and building up a binary tree implicitly. Um, so uh, this, is an this is sort of a cartoon of how that doubling procedure works. So we start out at that black point there um, with initial momentum pointing in that direction. Uh, so we, uh, this is four doublings. So we each, each doubling, we flip a coin to decide whether to go forwards or backwards. So we go forward one, and then we flip another coin, go backwards two, flip another coin, go backwards four, flip another coin, go forwards eight. Um, and you know, this might keep going for, uh, for longer. Um, and uh, so, right, this criterion uh, that I just defined here, right, that is uh, only defined, that's defined across for pairs of states, right? So um, any, the, basically, uh, for any two of these states, we can ask, has this trajectory made a U-turn yet? Are we going backwards? Um, and uh, so, unfortunately, we can't just ask, is the back of the tra uh, trajectory and the front of the trajectory making a U-turn um, because uh, that would violate detailed balance, which is a uh, tough but fair master, I guess. Um, and uh, we also really don't want to have to consider all possible sub-trajectories because there's just way too many of them. Um, so instead what we do is we look at the trajectories defined by uh, balanced binary subtrees of these um, of the entire tree corresponding to the trajectory we've traced out so far, right? So like uh, the trajectory from here to here, right? From there to there, we might ask, uh, from here to here, here to here, but not from like here to there, uh, right? Because that's not an entire balanced binary subtree. Um, so that's the, the, and so then we only have to do work uh, proportional to the number of, uh, of states that we visited, and that's totally dominated in any reasonably large problem by the cost of gradient computation, um, even reasonably moderate size problem. Uh, okay, so an actual iteration of nuts. Um, we start here. This is a contour of our target distribution. Um, we trace out the dynamics both backwards and forwards in time. Um, and uh, so basically we keep going until that uh, uh, basically, the reason that this trajectory stopped is because there's eight states at the back of the trajectory, up, or the front of the trajectory up there. Um, and if you look at the vector from the first of those states to the last of those states, it makes an angle of just slightly less than 90 degrees with the momentum vector at the end of the trajectory. So that tells us that it's time to stop doubling. Um, we actually have to, so then we uh, have to be careful about which of these states we actually choose as our next state. Um, so we actually can't choose any of the states that aren't in the same half tree as the state that we started in. Um, so uh, that's just uh, because basically if we did choose one of those states, um, we might, uh, if we started from here, say, uh, then we could, we could regenerate this half of the trajectory, but then we would decide to stop and there would be no way of getting back to where we started. And so that's not a valid proposal. Um, so uh, I know that's going kind of fast, but um, in the interests of time, I'll keep moving. 
so we also, um, we also need a way of, uh, of tuning this step size, which we do using a slight elaboration of Nesterov's dual averaging algorithm. Um, you could also use Robbins Monroe for this, and people have. Um, this seems to work a little bit better. Uh, and so basically the idea is that we want uh, epsilon to be, you know, big enough but not too big. We're measuring that in terms of the average HMC acceptance probability, um, which uh, we set a target <coughs> delta. Uh, and, you know, basically that, that's, uh, so it's still a parameter that you have to set, but it's much less sensitive to it, basically. If you set delta equal to like 0.6, uh, 0.65, you'll do fine, generally. Um, whereas epsilon varies by orders of magnitude across problems. Um, and we can use this for both HMC and nuts, and we will in the experiments. Um, so our goal is to figure out whether or not, uh, as to compare the efficiency at generating effectively independent samples of nuts and HMC, right? So the question is, how quickly can we generate samples that are not dependent on the previous states uh, in the Markov chain? Um, so we tested uh, nuts and HMC on four target distributions. One is this 250-dimensional multivariate normal with strong correlations. So that's a synthetic example. Uh, then uh, the other three are actual Bayesian posteriors. One is a Bayesian logistic regression with 25 coefficients. One's a hierarchical Bayesian logistic regression with uh, two-way interactions. So that's substantially more parameters, 302 dimensions there. And a, uh, a stochastic volatility model with 3,001, uh, 3,000 time points, 3,001 parameters that need to be estimated. Um, and uh, so we did a grid search on all of the various tuning parameters. So that's delta for both HMC and, nu HMC and nuts and uh, the simulation length for HMC uh, and ran a bunch of iteration, uh, ran a bunch of experiments and, uh, and they're all displayed in the following plots. So um, I'll just break, there's a lot of data on these slides, so I'll just break it down. So the, the y-axis is number of effectively independent samples per gradient evaluation. Uh, so that's basically a measure of sampling efficiency, uh, number of effect, basically how many effective samples we've generated compared to like an IID sampler, um, divided by the amount of work that we've done. Uh, higher is better. And um, the x-axis is the accuracy target delta. Um, and uh, don't worry too much about that, just sort of, if you focus your attention on the middle uh, and just notice that we're not that sensitive to delta, and that's, uh, that's all you need to pay attention to there. And so for this example, the 250-dimensional normal, um, uh, NOTS actually outperforms HMC, uh, no matter what trajectory length you, do, you use. And, uh, and indeed, as, uh, as is well known, HMC's performance strongly depends on the trajectory length that you choose. So each one of these subplots, uh, aside from the one at the far left, is HMC with a different trajectory, target, uh, with a different trajectory length. Um, and so around here in this area, you're doing well, uh, reasonably well, um, although not as well as nuts. Uh, but if you, get, if you go too far, your performance suffers. If you go not far enough, your performance suffers. Um, we see a somewhat similar picture for the logistic regression model. Um, here we're getting basically the same performance as HMC um, with the best parameters, but substantially better than HMC with poorly chosen trajectory lengths. Um, hierarchical logistic regression, similar story to logistic regression. Um, we're doing maybe a little worse than optimal HMC, but not much. Um, uh, it looks like there's a less variance perhaps. Is that uh -huh. that? Um, yeah, there does seem to be, and that's pretty, well, maybe a little more for the 250 dimensional normal. That's partly an artifact of, um, uh, of the kind of randomness in the um, selection of the uh, of epsilon of the step size, um, which uh, not seems to be seems to play a little better with that um, and have a lower variance estimate of the step size than HMC, than HMC does. Um, but that's a good observation. Um, finally, the uh, stochastic volatility model. Uh, here again, we're doing substantially better than HMC does uh, for any trajectory length. And, um, and again, <laughs> uh, nice. Uh, so, and again, uh, the um, uh, HMC's performance is strongly dependent on trajectory length. Uh, so, just to wrap up, I'm out of time. Uh, but NUTS is an extension of HMC that gives you the performance of HMC without the need to tune these, uh, tune these parameters, which makes it um, 
uh, both more user friendly and also uh, applicable, also um, uh, easier to use in a generic inference package like STAN, which is something we're working on at Columbia, uh, which is a generic inference package sort of in the model of bugs or JAGs, but with less of a tendency to choke on uh, small to moderate size problems. Um, and I also have MATLAB code implementing nuts if you want to uh, take a look at that. It's on my website. And, um, and that's it. Thanks a lot. I'll also uh, be at the poster outside. Questions? So you, you do uh, come up with a very smart way of preserving Dell values when it comes to your and, and that's quite commendable. However, uh, since your chain is not uh, homogeneous anymore once you adapt to Epsilon, mm -hmm. Um, you're kind of throwing the tail balance out of the way. Uh, yes, sorry, I should have been uh, clearer about that.